Number one. The following story was translated from the Japanese website, 2chan. I live on the outskirts of Sapporo in Hokkaido, Japan. It's an extraordinarily safe place to live, albeit a little freezing cold. This story just so happened to take place during a particularly cold winter there. The whole area was covered in snow, and the sun was beginning to set. I was power walking along the Ishikari River, desperately trying to get home. Even after living here for the past ten years, I still haven't gotten used to that damn cold. As I made my way along the riverside, I noticed a man up ahead, standing with his back to me. He had his hood up over his head, and, despite all the snow, he was barefoot. I scanned the area, and there was absolutely nobody else around. Now, as I mentioned, I lived in an extremely safe part of the world, but even still, I felt a little uneasy. There was just a weird atmosphere about the guy. The way he was standing completely still, with his back turned to me. Well, he obviously wasn't looking at the river. Was he just standing there, staring at the ground? Not to mention, I'm a five foot two, petite woman, and this guy appeared to be at least six foot, very tall by Japanese standards. Still, I put all those worries to the back of my mind. The man remained perfectly still as I came to pass him. I muttered a quiet, good evening, under my breath, in a vain attempt to ease my unease, I suppose. He didn't reply as I walked past. All I could hear were the sounds of my footsteps, rhythmic and predictable. After ten or fifteen steps, though, something interrupted the flow of their beat. I turned around and saw that the barefoot man was following behind me now. But his face, the best way I can describe it is like a mannequin, or one of those wooden figures that artists use. Don't get me wrong, his face was fleshy, but there were no features. His head was faceless, just like an operabo from Japanese folklore. As I picked up my pace, he did as well. Now, extremely frightened, I broke out into a sprint, desperate to get away from the faceless man. Looking back over my shoulder, I could see that the man was running at full speed as well, no longer just keeping pace, but actually gaining on me. I'd never felt such fear in my life. I managed to make it to a corner with a bridge. From it, passing cars could see me. If this was the end, there'd at least be witnesses. I turned around one final time to see how close the man was to me now. But that's the thing. He was just standing there, frozen in place once again. He stood, facing me, if you want to call it that, and remained motionless as I fled into the distance. I ran all the way back to my home, unsure of what to do. Should I call the police? What should I tell them? That I saw a noperabo? As the night went on, I continued to deliberate. By midnight, I decided to sleep on it. I fell into a deep slumber, exhausted by the events of the evening. I was awoken by a series of loud, melodic notes. It was my front doorbell. I rubbed my eyes and checked the clock next to my bed. 3 a.m. What the hell? To say I was surprised would be an understatement. I have an app on my phone with a camera that's linked to my doorbell. That way, I can see who's standing at my front door without ever having to get up and check. I opened the app to see who in God's name was ringing my doorbell at 3 in the morning. The live footage from the camera popped up. Standing at my front door, with his head close up to the camera, was that same faceless figure I had seen by the river. It had somehow followed me. I dropped my phone in a state of pure shock. In a panic, I immediately ran into my bathroom and locked the door. My mind was racing, and I knew I had to call somebody for help. 
The police, my parents, my friends or my neighbors, I didn't care. Just anybody who could make this faceless man disappear. Stupidly, I had left my phone on my bed after I dropped it, but I was far too scared to leave the safety of my locked en suite. After twenty minutes, I finally worked up the courage to go and get it. I lifted my device, and, with my eyes half covered by my hands, reopened the app to see if he was still standing in my doorway. The live feed popped up again. The faceless man was nowhere to be seen. I took the opportunity to call my father. I told him some strange man had stalked me to my house, that he had come for me in the night. Needless to say, he rushed over and arrived only a few moments before a police car. He had taken the liberty of calling them for me. I explained the situation to them all, told them about bumping into a faceless man by the river. I showed them my app, which confirmed my doorbell had indeed been activated at three in the morning. Frustratingly, the app didn't have a record function, so I had no definitive evidence to show them. Okay, said one of the cops. Be on the lookout for a man with no face. Got it. I thought he was mocking me, so I insisted I was being serious. Oh, believe me, I'm taking this seriously, ma'am, he said. You're not the first one around here to report this guy. As of right now, nothing's come of their investigation. I don't know how many people in my town have claimed to have seen this guy, but from what the cop said, I at least know I'm not the only one. There's one final detail I have to share. When the police searched the area, they found a set of footprints in the snow, mud and grass around my house. They led from my front doorstep all the way around the perimeter of my house. Whoever had left them had stopped outside every one of my ground floor windows. The prints had obviously been made by somebody walking barefoot. No DNA could be extracted from them. Number 2 I live in a remote, rural part of East Oklahoma. Nothing but farmland, wide empty fields or forests all around, depending on which direction you're looking. The nearest town is a solid ten minute drive away from here, and before that, there's barely any signs of life at all. Oftentimes, I feel a little isolated here, especially since I live by myself. I arrived home from town one evening, just before sunset. It had been a long day at work, and to be honest, I was exhausted. I fed my little dog Curly, a Jack Russell Terrier, and then set about fixing up some dinner for myself. After that, I eased myself down into my armchair and flicked on the TV, put on some mindless show to zone out to. Ah, oh, just what the doctor ordered, I thought. A nice, relaxing evening. As I watched TV, my eyelids became heavier and heavier. At some point, I drifted off to sleep. I woke up in my armchair a couple of hours later to the sound of Curly barking. Damn dog, I said, frustrated. Oh, shut up, would you? With that, Curly obediently fell silent. Good boy. It was pitch black outside now. The TV was the only thing lighting the room. Oh, I felt groggy and dazed, the way one does when they're suddenly woken up mid-nap. I stood up and made my way towards the kitchen to get a glass of water. I walked through to the hallway. Like I said, I was in a tired frame of mind, which is probably why it took me a moment to process that my front door was wide open. I always leave my front door locked. Living alone in the sticks can make a guy paranoid, and I never take any chances. My first thought was that some animal had wandered into my house while I slept, but that of course didn't make any sense. As far as I knew, there weren't any animals in this part of the country that could unlock a door. My thoughts went to Curly. He never usually barked for no reason. Confused, I walked back into the living room. There, 
hiding under the coffee table, was Curly. I had never seen him like this before. He was looking directly into the dark dining room ahead of him, staring at something with surgical focus, absolutely transfixed. Had he not been shaking, you'd have probably thought he was a small statue. He knew something I didn't, namely, what was in the dining room. All I could see through the doorway was darkness. The sound of a commercial played in the background from my TV. I inched closer to the dining room entrance, and Curly began to squeak, as if to warn me not to go in. I must have only been about six or seven steps from the doorway when I heard creaking from my dining room floorboards. My throat began to feel tight as the reality of the situation dawned on me. Then, through the blackness of the entrance, a huge, hunched-over figure stepped out towards me. It walked through into the living room and stood up in front of me. It was the tallest man I had ever seen in my life. He must have been seven feet tall, and he looked to be well-dressed. His upper body was immensely broad, but his lower body and limbs were long and stick-thin, like an emaciated skeleton. Its head. I wanted to vomit when I looked at it. It was far too small for its huge body, half the size of a normal human head. The light from my TV lit up its face. I thought I was going to pass out, but I couldn't help but stare at it. The best way I can describe it was like the face of a porcelain doll. Its skin was extremely pale and had absolutely no blemishes or markings, with a sheen like it was made of china. The shape of a human face was there, but the features were like a child's and looked as if they had been painted on. It was like a giant living doll. The expression remained frozen on its face as it just stood there, looking down at me six steps away from me. Hell, maybe only three steps for him. We just stood, looking at each other for what could have been five seconds or five minutes. Curly was going wild. It was surreal. That's when it let out the most disturbing, distorted wail I have ever heard. The tall man then stepped awkwardly towards me, the expression on its baby face unchanged. I ran to escape it, but it pushed past me and made for the front door. It ran out of my house, its thin legs struggling to hold up its body. I dashed upstairs to get my rifle, terrified it might return. I checked it was loaded, and then looked out my bedroom window. I watched from my window as the man-thing sprinted from my house. It leapt over the fence separating my property from the field next door and began running through the empty plains. It was a dark night, but there was just enough moonlight for me to make out one final, disturbing detail. Without stopping, it twisted its head around until it was on backwards, so those soulless, empty doll eyes could look back at me as it ran away. My stomach almost hit the floor. It kept its porcelain face turned towards me as it faded into the tree line at the end of the field. I knew I should call somebody and tell them what just happened, but who? Hello, police. A huge, doll man thing just broke into my home and he took nothing. You know, what could I say? I confided in friends and family, who, guess what, told me I was going nuts. Hence why I'm sharing my story here. I wanted to get this off my chest, share it with people who might actually have something more constructive to say about my experience. People who won't just call me mad. I've done some research, and it seems like there have been some similar sightings in Hawaii. I don't think I can be alone in my experience. If anyone else knows what these things are, or has any other information to share, please let me know. Number three. It was late one night, and I needed to take the tube, the London Underground Metro, back to my apartment. Unfortunately, 
I'd failed to keep an eye on the clock. I'd made it to the station, but the last train home was in just a few minutes. I rushed down the escalators, corridors and stairs to the platform, only to see the train doors close right there in front of me. It took off through the tunnel, leaving me stranded. Damn it. I didn't have a lot of cash, so paying for a taxi all the way back to my home was going to sting. I took a seat on the platform so I could rest my weary legs and think for a moment. No more than two minutes after the last train had left, to my surprise, I heard the sound of another train coming down the tracks. That was odd, I thought. There had been no announcements through the station speakers, and the sign that displayed all the upcoming trains was just blank. Not to mention, when I checked the timetable for the trains, the previous train was definitely the last one scheduled. I decided not to question it, and just accepted that karma had thrown me a bone. The train began to slow down, and as it did, I could see inside every passing carriage. There was nobody on the train. Each carriage was completely empty. I mean, I figured there wouldn't be many people catching the last train at this hour on a Wednesday, especially since this station was relatively quiet at the best of times, but it seemed odd that there was nobody else on board. As the train came creaking to a halt in front of me, the strangest thing happened. Unlike all the others, the carriage that stopped directly in front of me was absolutely full of people. I was a little weirded out, to be honest. Why was everybody in this part of the train and not the other parts? Only the doors for the full carriage lit up. All the others remained inactive. Guess this journey was going to be a tight squeeze. I got ready to push my way on board, and in typical British fashion, kept my eyes low and my earphones in. Don't want any of that uncomfortable social interaction now, do I? As the doors opened before me, I tried to push past the people standing directly by the door. I'm only a small person, and figured I'd find a little nook to stand in further in the carriage. As I nudged past the first few travellers though, I noticed something. Their bodies didn't react the way I expected. Their limbs felt hollow as I squeezed past. I mean, it didn't feel like I was pushing past flesh. Even the light force of my body moving past them seemed to make them come unbalanced and stumble from side to side. I took out my earphones to apologize and looked up to make eye contact. It hardly registered at first, but after a second of confusion, I was horrified to see that the man in front of me had absolutely no face. There was just a plastic looking, white space where his face should have been. He had a head, sure, but no facial features whatsoever. He looked just like a mannequin that you'd see at Forever 21 or something. Don't get me wrong, he was moving like a normal person. He just had no face. Just like the woman standing next to him, and the man next to them and the one beside him, and the woman sat across from me, and the child that was with her. Everybody on board. They were all the exact same. Pure white, plastic looking, faceless and hairless, dressed in clothes like normal people. Like a whole train carriage of mannequins that you'd see in a shop window. And what was worse, from the shape of their heads, I could tell they were all looking directly at me. All of them were dead silent. They literally made no sound. They shuffled and stood up and moved, but there was no talking, no rustling of material, no breathing or any natural human sounds at all. The silence was broken by the train doors. They started beeping, signaling that they were about to close. I immediately pushed back off the train and managed to get out just in time. The thought of being trapped inside with those faceless people. The thought of it even today. The faceless heads in the window continued to stare at me as the train finally pulled away from the platform. It disappeared into the tunnel. I decided paying for a taxi wouldn't be such a bad idea after all. This was easily the eeriest experience of my life, and I can't seem to make sense of it. If it was some kind of prank... It was extremely elaborate. 
there were too many people involved. Not to mention, they would have had to get their hands on an entire goddamn train. I've steered clear of using the tube at night ever since. Hey guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. Well, something very different this time. Uh, I thought it was good to try something new. Usually I stick to a more the real world kind of stuff, you know what I mean? Abandoned homes and creepy people and all that kind of stuff. But sometimes it's fun to delve into the supernatural. Especially a topic that hasn't been covered by many YouTubers, so uh, yeah, variety is the spice of life, I guess. If you did enjoy the video, then please be sure to smash that like button and share it around with your friends on social media or whatever. Every little helps, every little helps. Speaking of help, I'd like to thank my biggest supporters on Patreon. Matthew J. Bauer, Anime Wimp, Fun With Failure, Stephanie, Crazy Mask Parade, James Labor, John Crouch, Lester Lido, Procubidine Netter, Bob the Davil, Gina Valera, Philip Westra, Alex Greensall, Monica Mendoza, Sion of the Emperor, Crawford K. MacDonald, Marley Wright, and Ray Price Burton. Thank you so much, guys. If you'd like to support me on Patreon too, you can find a link down in the description below. Until next time, guys, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.